brace yourself because you're about to dive into another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. And we just want to let you know that whether you're looking for a companion through your paranoid insomnia, entertaining yourself through one of life's mundane activities, or trying to ward off the internal screams of all those sad, smothered souls around the office, THC is here. And you should know that every episode of the Higher Side Chats has an entire second hour for Plus members. Sign up at thehiresidechatsplus.com and you'll get years of Plus show archives, lifetime forum access, a special invite to Greg Carlwood's monthly joint sessions, MP3s of THC music, bonus episodes, tour videos, and 10% off t-shirts, grinders, and whatever else ends up in the Higher Side store. It's $8 a month that you won't miss, so become a Plus member and treat yourself in these troubled times. Always action-packed and commercial-free, which means you'll unfortunately never hear my voice again. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. The power of Christ compels you, dear people. How we doing out there? Drinking a little drink, smoking a little smoke from sunny San Diego. I'm Greg Carlwood. And while I still do proudly display my conspiracy culture merit badges on my well-tailored, slim-fit, pinstripe vest of justice, in recent times it's been getting harder and harder to do so. The fact is that conspiracy culture has been mainstreamed, and thus the waters have gotten muddier than Woodstock in the rain. And some of us have gotten so backwards that we put our faith in not-so-democratically-elected presidents, salivate slack-jawed over another military intelligence-approved nothing burger and UFO disclosure, or shout from the digital hilltops of the very social media mental prisons the sorcerers of Silicon Valley have so graciously crafted for us. Like any good Kansas City shuffle, it seems that while keyboard warriors decode another Trump tweet and measure curvature on computer screens, They've lost sight of the corporate criminal class, the ever-expanding empire, and the deep reflection of what reality even is and our place in it. In fact, people will tell you magic isn't real while they simultaneously sacrifice their sovereignty on the altars of convenience and distraction. I empathize, though, because the Western world is an ocean of social engineering hooks, both new and old, freshly cast and long abandoned, and we are but fish swimming through this obstacle course, trying to navigate without being reeled into another behaviorist's boat. And that is why we welcome back the great Gordon Magic Making White for a routine checkup and recalibration of all things alternative on what is not only his 10th appearance on THC, but also his birthday. You know Gordon as the headmaster of his own podcast and digital hogwarts at runesoup.com, where he offers the best classes known to man on topics like ancestors and the dead, magical geography, the saints, sigils, grimoires, out-of-body journeying, and more. He's the author of Starships, The Chaos Protocols, and Pieces of Eight. He's also fresh off an Amazonian ayahuasca retreat I can't wait to hear about, so let's do the damn thing. Blowing out the digital candles on the conspiratorial birthday cake, the higher side's head maester of the dark arts, the globe-trotting wizard and high pope of permaculture and parapolitics, the magical mascot of Tasmania, coming in at the ripe old age of 27, bend the knee and kiss the ring, Gordon, my man, welcome back to the higher side. Thank you so much. Well, that was best birthday gift ever that is uh that is yeah uh, <laughs> 10 times lucky that's quite the intro <laughs> kind of you to say i appreciate that you know i i tried really hard with this one and david ikes and it was like he didn't even notice so i appreciate <laughs> that but you know i've been looking forward to ever since we like you know locked in the time i'm like oh i did mention it's my birthday i wonder if he's gonna like put in an extra bit of effort and he sure did that was awesome and uh, you got my you know you know, age right, as far as anyone knows. <laughs> yes, well, after 10 times, it is getting harder to say things I haven't said before. So I did recycle a bit like a good Californian, but <laughs> this is going to be fun. You just took this big trip to the Amazon. You've released a ton of new stuff since we last talked. And we're going to talk about some issues in the conspiracy culture that seem a bit off to my simple stoner mind. But 
let's start with something nice and safe and get into this Amazonian ayahuasca adventure. I know people always say this sort of thing, but I really was so close to going and then I pushed out, but it is what it is. I watched your trip report that you put up for your premium members, which is a great slideshow of all things that matter. What's the food like? Where do I sleep? And do I have to shit myself in front of my friends? It all made me feel much more comfortable and I really do want to make it next year. I know in a lot of ways this trip followed the typical ayahuasca retreat narrative, but because you have so much experience with spirit contact, I am curious how this was different or unique. Was it more potent, perhaps? I'll tell you, I had not done, you know, I've done a lot of entheogens over the 27 years I've been alive. I'd never done ayahuasca i'd done ayahuasca analogs and i'd smoked dmt a bunch of times and the reason for that was i had kind of promised myself that i was going to do it quote unquote correctly which was this with an ayahuasca or a shaman in the jungle you know on country in the maluka the proper way there was something about ayahuasca in particular that for me felt that she deserved that Mm -hmm. and so in that sense yes the encounter with as you say, like I do have a reasonable amount of experience compared to the normal person, I suppose, of spirit contact. But this is that dialed up to 11. What I'm so interested in for most people about ayahuasca is not only is it effectively a miracle medicine, but if you want that, what I call in Cares Protocols, becoming invincible experience, if you want to know viscerally and in an embodied sense that spirits in some way, shape or form exist, Get yourself to a qualified and trained shaman and be in ceremony with ayahuasca and you will come away knowing that. And that was kind of why one of the things that had just been a bucket list item and it showed up at the right time. And it was for that reason. It was to see if it is that dialed up to 11 embodied spirit contact thing. And that it was that it was. (laughs) Yeah, man, it's definitely a bucket list item for me, too, or. I always thought of it as one, but then once you have the opportunity to actually do it, it starts to get very real, and I started to get quite anxious, and uh, I was like, ah, I'm not going to do it. I can't do it, but... I told you I'd hold your hand the whole way. We told you we get recorded. Like, when I go back, you know, I don't mean like I'm an expert, but I mean, I know what I'm doing operationally now, not in the actual... Although, the shaman, (laughs) you'll, you'll actually really like this, Greg. There was something about me that meant that it would affect me much later than other people. So other people would come up within the first half an hour, 45 minutes. And one night it took me three hours. And the total ceremonies are only like four to five hours, depending on how high everyone gets. And so I I took more ayahuasca. I actually consumed more of it than anyone else who was in ceremony with me. And so I was not only high late, I was really, really high. And it was really fun. This is the kind of like Caucasian gold medal that the shaman actually said, yeah, you might get high late and get really, really high, but you're good at it. You're good at ceremony. You don't fight it. You don't, you know, freak out or anything. And that was just when you hear that. Yeah, that's a Caucasian gold medal. So I don't mean that I'm an expert in that sense. I mean, this is the absolute best way of going on that once in a lifetime journey with people who are experienced at it and take it extremely seriously and And yes, so we can hold your hand the whole way. Right. I mean, it can't get more comfortable. It's like, if not now, when? So pretty much that was my thinking behind it. That was my thinking behind why I chose now as well. Like we're both quite busy. And I'm like, well, when am I not going to (laughs) be? Well, trial by fire, I guess. I guess it's got to happen. So this is a question I wanted to ask you about this thing. It's going to get really complicated already, but one of your best Rune Soup episodes this year for me was talking plant cognition and communication with Dr. Monica Gagliano. Really great. And she would refer to a plant like mimosa as a collective spirit, I guess, over the whole genius. And of course, most ayahuasca reports refer to Mother Ayahuasca, the specific spirit even though ayahuasca is a combination of things. But the point is that when we take some compounds and we have a breakthrough experience, for me, it's just been a transportation to, say, the spirit world, and then just a communication with whoever is there. The whole machine helps then, you know. But then Mm -hmm. some people, when they take this specific compound, are talking to a specific spirit. And I guess I'm just trying to work out these tangled threads around plant spirits, entheogens, 
the mechanisms that get you over there versus consistently dialing up a specific number? Any idea how to help me untangle this knot? Sure. So, yeah, frankly. So, as I said before, I'd smoked DMT, but I hadn't taken ayahuasca. And so this is an oversimplification, but it's a useful one. If you want to just get there, if you want to get to the machine elf realm, smoke DMT. Most commonly, and this is where it's sort of, it's mostly right, but also not, based on not just my experience for the last couple of weeks, but the other people who are on dieta with me. Ayahuasca, as you say, it's a combination of the copy vine and the chakruna leaves, right? So it's not the spirit of a plant. But if you consume it in ceremony with an ayahuascaro who has made it and sung the Icarus into it and called her into, you know, temple and ceremony and so on, you get ayahuasca as spirit. And in kind of like the first journey, it was very much in the spirit world. In the second one, it was very much her being in ceremony and providing the healing that as a cosmic medicine she does. So for me, that was the difference in those two explicitly. With mushrooms, it's a bit of both. You can interact with mushroom. I tend to do it in an invocation sense. And then you're in mushroom space and you kind of encounter things that are in there, but also your memories. Ayahuasca was in a funny way close to that. You were interacting with ayahuasca and where she would take you or what she would show you. With smoking DMT, it's much more like punching into that weird machine over now there were a couple of people in dieta one girl in particular one woman i guess which is young who had an experience during one of the ones that the main theme was around healing of everyone who was there and most people had kind of like ayahuasca was healing me a sort of cosmic nurse hospital sense and she had it she said it was like giant bugs she could see giant bugs in the maloka like big ants mantids essentially performing psychic surgery on people and so we had the discussion the next day and i'm like well Yes, it's almost like you tipped further into the ayahuasca realm because that has a motif match to what people who smoke DMT. It's not exact, although it also is. Like, mantids are a good enough description of the stuff you encounter when you're in smoking DMT machine elf space. So you can tell that there's almost maybe a spectrum, I don't know. But she was one of the only people who had experiences with motifs that were more commonly associated with, at least for me, smoking DMT. Because I didn't get really any machine elves the entire two and a bit weeks we were in the jungle. I got traveling in spirit. I got ayahuasca. I got all that kind of stuff, but not what I was kind of expecting was a bit more like having smoked DMT. So that's what it is for me. I think if you approach ayahuasca in an almost analog, dare I say correct, I'm not sure if I want to use that word exactly, but in an analog and traditional sense, you will get ayahuasca as spirit. And if you do it in a I'm going to, you know, extract or synthesize dimethyltryptamine 4 and freebase it, you're going to get something more extreme and almost maybe, almost like maybe we're not supposed to be there. I don't know. But that's how I currently have it hanging in my head. Yeah, it is a weird thing to work out and just think about how these different compounds affect our interaction between the two worlds. It's quite trippy. I mean, it's it's a huge difference in in an infinite spirit world to be able to talk to one entity directly as opposed to just wandering around and seeing who shows up. Like I've never been able to visualize or see any of the things I've talked to. It's all just like a consciousness kind of. Well, that's not true. You've seen it. So, for instance, when you're interacting with the star out in the desert, yeah, you could see the star. It just it looked like a star, and that's actually quite normal. So. Because it took me so long to come up, I'd get bored. The night in particular took three hours. I'm like, oh, come on. Like, I'm lying down and everyone's purging around me. And I'm, that's it. I'm getting up. So I got up and I left the Maloka. And it's the middle of the night in the jungle. It's beautiful. Mm. Clear sky. It's just perfect. We're by this river, stars. And I noticed, because it wasn't that I was completely sober. It's just that I was mildly altered. It was kind of like being a bit stoned, frankly. But with the difference that I could sense the intelligence of every single different plant, tree, vine, giant frogs, like on the walk back one night and so on. And you kind of realize at that point that whether it was ayahuasca specifically or entheogens in general, if you took the dose correctly, had a tremendous advantage to hunting groups because I was aware and in some form of communication with the more than human world around me in the jungle at the time. So, and I think that's, an, I didn't get that. You don't really get that kind of stuff if you smoke DMT, but I didn't get that to the same level of precision 
with any other entheogen. I get it a bit with mushrooms on the farm, but I got it like I, I swear I speak jungle when, when I'm on ayahuasca in the jungle. And that is sort of to your point that I didn't see them differently, but I was just completely confident and aware of the individual intelligences of each thing that was there. Now, when I ended up when the medicine, you know, did actually get me properly high and I went back into the Maloka, then I was encountering the sort of riverside camp that we were on as this much more like classic paintings of ayahuasca journeys, all the sort of colors and, and what have you in that really perspectivist sense. Then I encountered it, but it was interesting and almost like at a lower dose, you could just be in the jungle at night and be amongst friends, I guess is a weird way of saying it, but that's what it felt like. Well, that's awesome because that really was going to be my next question was just that a lot of starships is about restoring a magical context to anthropology and just the human story and what their ceremonies and these entheogen fueled spirit contact traditions are all about. And I was just curious if this being in like a really embedded setting with one of the most intense entheogens, if it affected the starship's hypothesis at all or how you looked at indigenous magic or these spirit contact traditions it seemed like maybe it did a little bit yeah sure and weirdly it was your experience with the star that got me outside because i've interacted with stars without entheogens and with them from a magical perspective for years and it suddenly occurred to me like because honestly once it got to two and a half hours and i was only a little bit stoned and everyone else is completely high I'm like, well, I guess that's what's happening to me tonight. So I might as well go out because I can walk. <laughs> I might as well go out and look at the sky and see what I can do, you know, interacting and magic wise and so on. And so absolutely, yeah, I think we would have a very similar experience of being able to have some sort of telepathic communication with the night sky on these things, because that certainly happened. And in that sense, it was a further validation. But what I noticed the most was the, which I hadn't done before, or I hadn't felt before, I just kind of intellectually knew it. I felt the hunting advantage of being good as a shaman or ayahuasca or wherever you are in the world where you have substances that can alter consciousness. I felt the hunting advantage because the jungle was talking to me and I was talking to it and I was supposed to be there. It, like everything fit and you would be able to see better in the dark and you kind of knew where animals and things were and that was really really interesting that it was almost like i had the impression of some of these plant spirits being allies which is what typically in magic you call them right like plant allies and so on but i had the impression of them being allies in the same way dogs are allies or have historically been allies as allies in a hunting group so that was that's in there in the starship's thesis but i hadn't personally experienced that before and that was kind of fascinating wow yeah i love it Man, I am excited and terrified for next year, definitely. Oh, we'll get a bit high and go hunting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, because hunting is just something I do all the time. Yeah, me too. Better do it high. <laughs> <laughs> but to switch gears a bit, this is your 10th time here, and it all started with a show that was largely about Gnosticism 101 and the idea that you being a fan of both magic and conspiracy felt like conspiracy researchers tend to make incorrect assumptions and claims about the magic parts of their repertoire because they lack experience with it, something that we're still talking about on the continued search for better models. But I thought it would be fun to circle back and close the loop here because I've had a lot of guests recently who think a Gnostic philosophy is what's driving the elite and their agendas, the arrogant idea that we should transcend this prison planet and become our own gods that it's driving the technologies of the Silicon Valley technocracy, that it's basically no different from Satanism. And, you know, we can zoom in on certain things in a minute, but broadly speaking, can you help us sort this out? Is Gnosticism a viewpoint that's helpful and empowering to the individual, or is it a driving force behind the elite secret religion and a component to something they're hoping the masses will adopt as the one world state religion eventually? It's definitely not a driving force behind the elite religion, except in the sense that they maybe not, wouldn't use the word archons, but they're aware of powerful non-human entities with which maybe off planet or not that they can interact with. Here's the thing, particularly when you have people on the show who have a background in Orthodox Christianity, Eastern Orthodox in particular. Let me describe it to you in DC universe terms. 
to Orthodox Christianity, Gnosticism is the Joker. It is the original villain. Before witchcraft, before the invading Moors, before whoever, Orthodox Christianity emerged historically as a reaction to the many Gnosticisms around it. So it is the villain they are most afraid of. And in fact, the fixity, which isn't necessarily a bad thing if you're a Christian and you're looking for an internally coherent, which I, I'm not interested in, but if you're looking for an internally coherent philosophy or a metaphysics that works, Eastern Orthodoxy is the Christianity that is internally consistent. Catholicism isn't because it sort of broke things for political reasons about 600 years after Christianity formed as a thing, right? It's still most people are Catholic and then Protestant from Catholic, but as a result, when you get people who come from that kind of Christianity, they're already predisposed to... Eastern Orthodoxy is built as a, essentially a refutation of a lot of stuff that you find in the multiple Gnosticism. So that kind of explains a lot of the antipathy if you're referring to a couple of guests you've had in particular. As for whether it is the right way of describing the elite belief system, I don't think it is. I actually think that's an inversion because, and it's funny that this kind of, I know we're going to talk about postmodernism later, right? It's sort of weird to me that it's a lack of understanding that makes people who are in conspiracy land suspicious of postmodernism and Gnosticism, because at a really high level, what they're both saying is that people in power will tell you a fake story to keep themselves in power. And that's essentially Gnosticism. Essentially, Gnosticism mm -hmm. is powerful things are giving you a false vision of reality. And if you don't work that out, you're fucked. And if you look at what postmodernism is, it's the same thing. It's that power produces our understanding of gender and money and the things we can and can't do. Like at a macro level, postmodernism is looking at how power changed the rules and definitions of reality across time. There's a flow model understanding of time that is as informed by that. And so is Gnosticism, really. And that's kind of why they don't like it, because it has this idea, especially if you come from a Eastern Orthodox point of view, what you're essentially saying is that sometime in the 300s, a bunch of men got the description of the universe perfectly accurate, and everyone else is wrong. And I'm not there. And I don't think, actually, if most of the listeners of the show are Christian or not, if you phrase it that way, I don't think they're there either. And it's just kind of funny, like libertarianism, which, you know, I'm... I'm a fan, but like, I know you've got a lot of libertarian types who listen to the show. Libertarianism has a high Venn overlap with something like postmodernism, if you actually understand what it is, because it's like, well, no, I reject the narratives and bars and restrictions that come from power. They're crap. It's always fascinated me, particularly in the last five or so years, that we've come back around to wailing on these things. And it's not that there are things within postmodernism that are... Uh, disappointing or subject to critique because it certainly are but it's weird that it gave um how to describe this it gave modern discourse a whole bunch of tools to understand and critique power that we didn't have before and what else are we doing here but that hmm. well said i mean we're in it now but <laughs> the, I, I like that thing about people in power will tell you a false story to stay in power if that is how we sum up these two philosophies, obviously, uh, that's where I put my money. But I guess I would ask how that works with postmodernism, because I understand the idea that uh, empire separates people into categories and then gets those categories to fight with each other. But they didn't create the categories of, say, men and women and some of these kind of things that are at the forefront of a lot of postmodern discussions. How does this work on the postmodern side? So, in a way, they did. So here's the thing. I wouldn't consider myself a postmodernist. I might consider myself a postcolonialist, because what happened in the 80s as postmodernism sort of had its peak when Foucault and the likes were still alive, you got some non-Western academics going, well, hold up a minute. It's all good to say that power, be it a king or a government or whatever, effectively and in large measure determines reality, like this is what we do and this is how we see the world. But the postmodern angle is coming from a 20th century materialist Marxist assumption that invalidates a whole lot of non-Western ways of being in the world. 
And a good example would be India, India coming out of a British imperial occupation and looking around at its options and going, okay, well, this is a deeply, a big part of a particularly Hindu, because obviously the country has millions of Sikhs and Muslims and so on as well. But from a Hindu perspective, it seems like the post empire option is to be some sort of French style atheist post Marxist. And that's a form of colonization, right? Because it's sort of this French idea that all your spiritualities and ways of being are, are little and relative and not actually true. So what I like about post-colonialism is that it has the same critique of power, but it also does its best to not impose a different Western narrative <laughs> on the world. And that's my main critique with postmodernism, that it kind of, I've called it an ersatz animism, because what you have is a flow model. You have this idea, and animism is a flow model. The, the postmodern one, because it's French and post-war, and thus deeply suspicious of transcendentalism or any kind of spiritualities, because they just had the Nazi occupation and so on. So the, the kind of like cosmic transcendental essentialist ideas was just anathema in Europe at the time. And you get it. This is historically, you understand why that happened. But what you have with Foucault and so on is this idea that history, and it's kind of informed by some 19th, important 19th century philosophers as well, but the idea that the things that are true change and evolve and interact based on power. Power creates truth rather than restricts it. Now, the main critique that people leveled was that there are other things that create truth in the world other than power. And that's very true. That's a really valid critique. But you can't remove the idea, indeed, that's literally what we're all doing here, that power, we think of power as suppressive or oppressive. What Foucault's insight was is that it actually creates and if you look at, we're talking about sex and gender, for instance, well, that comes down to definitions. Like biologically, even those categories in different power regimes change. So in non-Western ones, you have more than one gender. In, in animist cultures, you have more than two genders, right? And whilst the body may move differently in power, how gender is thought of and expressed is absolutely a function of power. And you see, for instance, in the 17th and 18th centuries, that men were makeup and wigs and high heeled shoes and, and so on in Northwest Europe. Like the men were the peacocks and the dandies until this guy, Bo Brummel, who sort of ultra peacocked and kind of changed men's fashion forever. But that's an example of how elite expressions of power create gender identity because that's how they're doing it. It's not an oppressive one. They're not restricting people to doing things. They're literally creating it. And it's almost like an inversion of how we think about it in conspiracy land, but it's nevertheless a really useful way of looking at the relationship between power and truth. The people, you know, in the kind of like Peterson world that are rejecting postmodernism are doing so for that same orthodox reason, which is they have a collection of ideas that they think permanently describe reality, and this stuff is coming to erase it all. But those collection of permanent ideas are embedded in a culture and a time. And you can't say with any confidence that this one group of like English speaking people in the mid 20th century got reality correct. And, and the rest of the billions of people who have lived or currently are alive haven't. If you do it correctly, you have a bit of humility with what we can and can't understand or what we do and don't know. And that's where I think in conspiracy land, people react to it because they're deeply emotionally attached to a whole bunch of premises that they have mistaken for eternal realities. And postmodernism gives you the option of putting that in flow, and people tend not to like that. <laughs> Fair, but to play devil's advocate and make the point that some of the more conservative or nationalistic researchers would make, if you don't own and value and preserve the culture or your heritage and its traditions, like the nuclear family, perhaps, then that is when the empire can co-opt it and steer it wherever they want to and send you down a, a, a dark path. I mean, that's their perspective is we have to keep this preserved because this is going to be manipulated or they're going to try to break this up. I mean, is that in play a little bit or, or how do you how how do you answer that? Sure. But like the things that people seem to protect as eternal categories are kind of recent. You use the nuclear family as an example. That's sort of 15 years of post-war suburban America. That's not how humans have lived. 
it's kind of racist. Like, it's not how humans have lived around the world, least of all in the West. We were multi-generational dwellings for millions of years, well, two million years, like if you include caves or however long we've been humans, right? But right through the West, you lived with your grandparents until they died because you had to take care of them. And, and the idea that one family can keep three households solvent is this kind of American idea that happened after the war when there was no other economic activity anywhere. And it's put us all in debt and basically broke the world in 2007. It's fucking dumb. <laughs> so... If they're talking about that as an eternal category, they're idiots. As for gender and sex, that also changes. And a bunch of it's shit. Like, I mean, you obviously know what side of those sort of discussions I'm on. But again, like with postmodernism, that doesn't mean that everything that comes out of that world is good or not right for critique. It's the opposite. It, it should be critiqued and examined. It shouldn't be dismissed or considered fucking evil. Because again, postmodernism doesn't come to destroy. It comes to put in flow. It comes to actually say your understanding of history is limited if you were worried that this tiny little moment where, what a surprise, heterosexual white males in a capitalist environment are at the apex. You've mistaken that for Western culture, and that's not good enough. And it isn't good enough. It's not that the, you know, white heterosexual males aren't valid categories and aren't whatever, but that's not good enough to say that the nuclear family and how we lived in the 1950s under segregation, for instance, and when homosexuality is criminalized, not good enough. And so the idea that the presence of something like postmodernism is going to make things worse is wrong. It will make it different, and it might make it worse if we do it wrong, but its mere presence doesn't make things worse. It makes things uncomfortable for power, and I like that. <laughs> As do I, and it is a tough place for me to be because I would say that I've always tried to be a do-no-harm conspiracy podcaster, but even when you try, the conspiracy world can still feel like old straight white guys talking about how the elite are making everyone gay or trans or brown or multicultural which is sad because these are some of the people who have had it the hardest, who the Empire has treated the worst. And the conversation sometimes starts to sound like we're being wary of people that are different rather than being weary of the elite. But I also don't want to be naively endorsing some sort of weird transhumanist agenda to end humanity. So I'm conflicted, you know. Oh, I completely get that. And what you said was really, really true, and I resonate with it, that a lot of the people who react to the impact of empire in their lives by being even semi-consciously racist or homophobic or whatever, that comes very often, as you point out, from a place of damage. They're impacted by it as well. And I completely agree. And as a result, what that does is change the tactics, which we're just not good at at the moment. We're yelling at each other all over the internet, arguing. And, and by the way, as you've kind of observed yourself, it's making things worse rather than better. So from a purely tactical perspective, maybe there's a different way of doing this. Maybe there's a different way of sharing ideas because somewhere in the kind of yelly transphobic world, there are people who are doing in-depth research into, say, Ray Kurzweil and other psychopaths. It's just that they've conflated it in a way that I think requires more nuance, which something like a postmodern or flow understanding of or contextualized understanding of power might offer them if they didn't immediately dismiss it. So it's really, it's a call for everyone to just be a bit nicer and more humble with the things you do and don't know, maybe, I guess, maybe that's what we do. Yes, absolutely. I definitely try to just let people speak their mind on this show, but it just so happens that a lot of them are speaking their mind in unison on this particular issue. So I'm glad we could talk about it a little bit. And I wanted to ask you about the road that leads to the gender issue in conspiracy land, which is this idea of the unification of opposites. And I want to ask you how big an aspect of occult philosophy this really is, because a lot of researchers focus on it almost exclusively where they see the 9-11 ritual and they say, look, they're collapsing the twin pillars of Jacob and Boaz and reforming a single tower to represent their new world. And then they apply this logic to the elite are trying to use CERN to open up gateways to the spirit world and let their demon overlords through en masse and collapse the two genders into one and the two worlds into one. And then God will have to reflood us out and start again. But 
What do you say about that? How big an aspect of the elite's philosophy is that even in your opinion? Of the elite philosophy, it's probably almost nothing. In terms of its origins within Western magic, um, it's 500 years, but really only 150 to 180, which is to say alchemy as it left Egypt with the Arabs or the Moorish invasion of Spain was much more physical. It was a weird combination. We don't really understand. It's difficult for us to get this, but it was almost like literal and metaphoric. So it was physical and they would actually be attempting to make gold. They were attempting to transmute physical things, but they were doing that as a kind of metaphor for how life exists on Earth with God in heaven and, and whatever, right? However, once, and largely thanks to alchemy, <laughs> but once, quote unquote, the beginnings of modern science, I guess, happened, so a few centuries back, the beginnings of chemistry and, and so on, alchemy metaphorized itself, let's say that. And so alchemy became like, a metaphor for the internal transformations that can happen. And that was sort of, it is sort of clunky, frankly. And then you hit the late 18th, early 19th century in the age of empires, where you have like the kind of white European understanding of things like Tantra from the actual browner corners of the world that had a less ruinous attitude to sex, in particular, you know, Southern Asia or South Asia. And so that's where you get, that's where Crowley and Eliphas Levy and all these people get it from, especially Crowley, right? They get it from the fact that these exotic colonized brown people that belonged to Britain in the 19th century were a fad. And so it's not some kind of eternal belief system from a, an elite that goes back millennia. It is historically range bound. And I think it's a poor interpretation of something like 9-11. And that comes back to, I think, what we had in our first or second discussion, which is have better magic chops if you want to interpret elite ritual behavior from a magical perspective, because sooner or later I'll come back on this show <laughs> and list where your thesis is wrong, specifically about magic. Now, 9-11 is riddled with uses of magic, and so is the elite. Definitely not arguing that. I am, however, arguing this unification of opposites as a foundational idea of a belief system at a super elite level. I don't see it, and it's not as old as people think. Mm. Yeah, it just seems to be almost the exclusive narrative as to where we're going. I mean, you can talk about 5G, and within a few breaths, people are getting to transgenderism with this transhumanist umbrella. I mean, David Icke cited it a few weeks ago here, unprompted. Even our friend Chris Knowles has been cataloging a surge in mermaid symbolism as this very thing. Cool. So transhumanism is absolutely on the rise, but it's more than the unification of opposites. So where people get that wrong as a ritual behavior is that's what I said before about postmodernism having an inheritance from the 19th century. It's specifically from Hegel, very much informed from the ideas of Hegel and the idea that it's like 50% correct. That's the thing. It's just that he had this notion that societies evolve in a pendulum unification of opposites way. So it swings super conservative and then swings back the other and, and crashes and becomes like a melded thing. And then that swings. And, and so we have like essentially one mechanism of how society develops. And there are cycles to society. So in that sense, it's kind of correct. But that can be misinterpreted as a ritual unification of opposites, because actually the Hegelian way of, of managing society did inform like some of the Alinsky school people, right? So Alinsky was not entirely, there are other things that he was inspired by, but that Hegelian way of managing society was something that he would teach and thus, as a result, taught to Hillary Clinton, you know. <laughs> so that is there. The idea that you can kind of smash things together to create a new thing is there as a tactic, not necessarily at a, at a ritual level, at a, at a universal sense. If that may, Like, uh, this is the bit, if we... They're there, and if you smush them together, ironically enough, if you make them all one, you miss the point. But transhumanism is more than, and I mean this as a negative, I'm not a fan, transhumanism is more than the unification of opposites. Transhumanism is the horizontalizing and extending, in their heads, the extending of human capacities beyond the human, because it, they see us as just meat and chemicals like everything else in the universe. So there's kind of like no, it's not like a unification of opposites. 
it's a spreading outness of chemicals and molecules from in this meat sack to the rest of it. That's more what's going on. That's more the, and that's absolutely what's going on. And that is the belief system. That's why you do have the rise of the mermaid archetypally, if not as a deliberate, which I don't think it is as much as Chris does. I don't think it's a deliberate signal or indicator. I think it's emerging from the collective unconscious because we're at this stage. And bearing in mind that it's a dangerous archetype because it's a siren, right? Like it, it leads ships onto rocks. So it is still worthy of consideration as to why it is so prominent in culture, because maybe it's a warning. <laughs> uh, but that's like, I think when we want to talk about transhumanism, which we should, because it's important, if we bundle all these things together, if we bundle the impact of Hegel on, on the kind of 20th century technocrats, and if we bundle in the sort of 19th century exoticism and imperialism of like secret society belief systems, which isn't in play as much as some kind of like weird ancient alien thing is at a super elite level. If you smush them all together, this is where I think we get a bit confused and react with confusion to the changes that are going on politically and parapolitically, because we're expecting it to be some sort of smushed together man mermaid merman <laughs> tower. And it's not that that won't help. And yeah. <laughs> genderless hybrid humans gordon that's what they're doing <laughs> no that's true yeah yeah yeah. but i don't think the right way of thinking about that is unification of opposites the hybrid or cyborg is absolutely where they're going or intending to go like the good news for people who are a bit alarmed by this as well you should be is it won't work it can't their foundational belief system is wrong like you are more than molecules Right. So it won't ever work. Like if you actually listen to Ray Kurzweil, if you watch his TEDx talk, you go that you you are some sort of deranged, upside down Christian apocalypticist. This is mental. So the good news is it won't work. And the bad news is they don't know that and are still pretty keen <laughs> in a, in kind of organizing society in that direction. Fair. And I'm glad that we can have uncomfortable conversations because uh, not everyone can. And this is where it gets into some landmine issues, and I'm just going to close my eyes and run. <laughs> but I listened to this recent time you were on Skeptico, and the conversation got into the Gloria Steinem and the feminism thing being a weaponized movement by the CIA. We've heard this before. And you had said they probably had an interest in feminism to see if it could be used for depopulation. And I agree with you there. But do you think that something similar has occurred in the time since with chemicals and hormones and the food and water supply that feminize men or to go further this new trend to give puberty blocking chemicals to so-called trans children it seems to have a similar shape to me in that goal of depopulation or regulating who's having kids and that kind of stuff what say you i know it gets a lot of airtime but simply put the number of kids who are receiving hormone treatment at the age of 10 is incandescently small. And as for the legality of it and so on, like this is what I mean about, obviously I'm, I'm pro-trans, right? That's fine. That doesn't mean that, because again, this kind of comes back to a postmodern thing, right? It doesn't mean that how we conceive of embodied gender right now in the middle of 2019 is correct. And so we need to cool our jets on that. And, and I, I just use the fact that other cultures around the world do have, I would say, better and healthier understandings of how embodied gender works, right? So I don't know if necessarily, unless it's a testing program, I don't know if necessarily providing hormone treatment to children is part of depopulation. But I, I'll tell you what is. It is the total cost of healthcare. It is the total cost of raising a child. My background is demography, as you know. And if you look at birth rates in Italy, in particular, because when Italy joined the EU, its currency, like places like Greece, strengthened. And so things got a lot more expensive. Access to debt was easier. But if you look at the birth rates in a very Catholic country, it goes from five kids to like 1.1 kids right. over that point in time. So this is why if you look at conspiracy over even before our time, Greg, because, you know, I'm 27 and I forget what you are. <laughs> But if you look at it over a multi-decade phase, it does appear in the 70s that they really were looking for ways to manually depopulate the Earth. And all of a sudden, and by that I mean in the mid-90s, 
that seems to have become less of a priority. And I would argue that they did what I used to do as a job, which is look at the demography of it and go, okay, well, we've China's done the one child thing and they have a demographic time bomb coming up. And we've made it extremely expensive to have children elsewhere. And we've put more women in the workforce. So conveniently, because, you know, not all of them are possessed by demons. Conveniently, they've, they're they looking at it. And this is true, by the way, that we think the planet's population is growing. It's only growing to 2050. And then it, and then it isn't. They've kind of achieved it. The population's going down. In terms of if you're a technocrat, the second half of the 20th century will have, as far as we can tell from just the um, inertia, a declining, a sort of flattening and then declining number of people. So I think it's more like that. Absolutely. I, I honestly think that's a, in a technocratic sense, that's a tick. It's a mission accomplished. They can unfurl the banner. And as far as we can tell, unless, you know, there's some sort of delayed chemical or genetic or viral thing that's going to happen between now and 2050. And, you know, let's not rule that out. I think it's more like that. I think that actually depopulation is currently happening. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I agree. And I think those economic pressures are one of the keys. Also, just it's not necessarily a feminizing of men, but just this idea that, I mean, look at if I think about what my grandfather was doing at 34, it's a lot, hell of a lot different and and more self-reliant and determined than what I'm doing. I mean, he's. I think a lot of people think of our grandparents' generation as they're building their own houses and then going off to work and having eight kids and just raising them all. And not that it was a paradise, but you can clearly see that has changed. And I think it's the domestication, maybe, rather than the pussification of the American male that, I mean, we're, we really are just not given the tools. And so we are all still, you know, millennials living in our parents' basement, hanging out on social media and in digital realities rather than facing the real world one. Yeah, sure. The thing is, let's use this as an example, like your grandfather didn't have the choice to be a podcaster. Fair. Maybe he'd want to be. So now you actually have both and he only had one. You have the choice to, I don't know, chop wood, camp, whatever. Like, but you do. Yeah, it's not out of necessity, but it is still an option. Yeah. And so when, I mean, because we're both, we're both millennials. I don't live in my parents' basement and neither do you. Fair. So... But the people who do, and let's be clear, it's the population that has lived with their parents longest in the 20th century, right? And 21st century, who knows? That is an economic side effect as much as it is anything else. So it's kind of like, well, yeah, the housing has historically never been this expensive. And we're in a situation where that's a challenging thing to solve. And also, I'm happy with multi-generational dwelling. Like, I, I think that's how we should be living. But I get what you're saying. Here's the thing that always fascinates me, right? Like, I'm completely fine with people. Like, everyone, just live your best fucking lives, right? So I don't care about people's gender identities or expressions or however many genders you can select on Facebook because I don't use Facebook. What I've never had explained to me is how the existence of more things is supposed to somehow take away from the existence of the original. Like, if you were on the Kinsey scale right up there, man's man, like, Chopping wood. Straight as an arrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, dressing like a 1970s lesbian, spitting, chewing tobacco, whatever. Like if you are ultra male, what does the existence of people along a non-binary spectrum, how does that, do they take some of your masculinity out and spread it across five people? <laughs> and that's the bit where I'm like, fine, just everyone, surely it's good news that humans can find and express <laughs> the way they want to be that makes them happy. And I don't get why if you're like a completely Lucille Ball vacuuming in a taffeta ball gown housewife, or if you're, yeah, a lumberjack, good, you know, <laughs> and that there'd be people in the middle. I guess, I don't know. I've never understood how the existence of one would negate the existence of another. Well said. And I think that's a excellent point. That's the kind of thing I wanted you to say in having this conversation is the kind of counterpoint that I wanted to try to put out there for people. And, you know, another thing about this postmodernism thing is that the conservatives argument is that, oh, the system wants to strip the labels off of everything and create this big homogenous mess. And then they think it degrades something of theirs. But I get this argument that 
labels and categories on the material plane mean less if everything is ultimately consciousness, and this material realm is just an illusion, but the material realm is our context at this part of the cycle. Labels and categories seem somewhat useful, but I guess it's like what they say about Martin Luther King Jr. When he was fighting for black people's rights, he was allowed to do that. It's when he started uniting poor people that they had to get rid of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Poor people and when you got anti-war. Yes. Look, it's it's not the labels. It's who owns the label maker. Mm. So that's the problem. The people who say they're trying to remove labels and turn it into a mush. No, motherfucker. I'm trying to take the label maker out of your fucking hand. Let's ha- <laughs> how about we share that around? Yeah. Because the people who say that are like, no, these ones are the men and these ones are the women. And, and you will go and fight in my war in the Middle East and turn Arab children to paste. Like, no. It's not removal of labels. It's, well, who's got the goddamn label maker? And that would be, funnily enough, that would be the postmodernist point. Mm, Touche. And I guess any idea can be weaponized. In fact, most of them usually are at some point. So I'm sure that's going to be in the mix and it's not completely black and white, but I definitely like that expression of it, the label maker. Yeah, 100%. And we're seeing that in cultures that are on the edge or in... Aspects of culture that are on the edge of increasing change. So as I said to Alex, you mentioned the uh, the Skeptico interview, that there is within, particularly from an academic perspective, the trans friends I have aren't academics. They're just living their lives. And and to some extent, and I'm thinking one in particular, one of my uh, Melbourne friends, when I bring them like, what about this person and this stuff? And they'll say like, this is trash. This person is crazy. And, And particularly in academia, which has always happened, well, when I say always happened, since the rise of elite universities in Britain and the United States, you will always have the weaponization of change opportunities at an academic level. And there is some crazy shit that is said about like trans lives and trans implications at an academic level, 100%. And it's just a bit of a straw man argument, though, for people who are anti trans to go and go, well, look at this person saying this. And I'm like, yeah, one dried up academic. Do you know any trans people who are just like, just doing their shit, right? And that's absolutely true. There's weaponization in all of this stuff, just in the same way I practice magic and I know damn well. And then funnily enough, I would argue that the slight majority of people who practice magic in the West are unaware of this. At a super elite level, damn right they're practicing magic. It's different to mine, but they are. And it's the same kind of like, well, that doesn't mean, let's not dismiss magic. Let's maybe not murder children in a super elite ritual at Dolphin Square or something, right? <laughs> that seems like a reasonable separation. And it's the same with any of the stuff we're talking about. And I kind of mentioned that with postmodernism. Like, it's not that these things are flawless or perfect or that we should all fall in line. Far from it. We should be in a situation to critique rather than reject. Mm. Cheers to that. And so the last thing I wanted to ask you, you know, I've definitely fallen behind on the courses and I sometimes feel like a poser when it comes to magic because I promote it a lot, but I don't put conscious attention into it all that much. But it's the same as good exercise or proper diet. I don't have to be perfect with these things to feel confident saying that they are things that can improve a person's life. But, you know, I've yet to take Ancestors in the Dead, Magical Geography, Saints or Journeying. What might be aspects of some of these most recent courses that a THC audience might like most if you had to pull one or two things out? That's real tough. Um, Assuming that they like getting high as much as you do. (laughs) And I mean, that's a big assumption, right? And, And the journey in course is very... One, it's a good stoner discussion because it, we talk about well, what are dreams and, and the imagination and is that different to the spirit world and as a result, not. So honestly, maybe it's the journey in course. Again, assuming that they like to get high as much as you do. Uh, my favorite, and I think the members has kind of been the same with the last couple of them, has been the Magical Geography course. Yeah. But that's like, as I said, it's my wheelhouse, permaculture, animism, so on. It's, it's how I live. It's probably the most personal. But for THC members, and like, to be clear, it's not a school. Like, you don't have to start with the first one. You don't have to do This is life. Do whatever you fucking want, right? But you, you certainly don't have to do the first course and then the second course and then whatever. It, it's You may know some of the stuff already. You may be only interested in a little bit of it or none of it. But how it works is 
the members each quarter will vote for the course we do the next quarter. So I don't even know what it is coming up for, what are we in? We're going into Q3, right? I don't know what it is yet. So it's it's sort of casual like that. And you definitely don't, it's not, and, and this is such a serious reason as to why, I think that 19th century shitty Freemasonic Golden Dawn model doesn't work or it would have worked. The idea that you can put together a magic course because you know everything there is to know about it and you, you've got to the top of it. So in year one, you do this and in year two, you do that. It's crap. It's crap for school. Like that, that structure is artificial in any kind of attempt to share information or experience, putting it in some kind of lunatic hierarchy that was originally based on the church doesn't work. You've done a bunch of shows about, you know, schooling and so on. It's not mm. how it's not how humans won. I'm still not sure how much I even know about magic, and I've been doing it for 20 years, right? Uh, more. But I can share the things that have worked for me and, and what I think's going on. And, and I share it horizontally, and then people play with it and share back. And, and that seems to be what we've done. And you don't even, like, people join and don't do any of the courses because they're just interested in seeing, you know, what these guys are doing and what we're talking about. And they find enrichment in it that way. And we also have some very serious and experienced magicians who are kind of like, you know, touching up their tech, I guess. Mm. Yeah, it really is kind of a special thing. And it's awesome to see because when we did our first interview of the 10, none of that existed. No. I don't yeah. think <laughs> either of us had a premium section yet. We were just doing podcasts. And uh, it's just awesome to see where it's gone. I really loved the first few courses. So I get really excited when I see the new one come out. Magical Geography and Journeying and even Saints are really high on my list. And Ancestors, they're all high on my list of things I want to do. I just have this weird habit of collecting things that, oh, I'm when I want to dig into X, Y, or Z, this is how I'm going to do it. And then I collect those things and then I just don't get that far on the to-do list. But that's totally always the case. And that's sort of my life as well. Like you, you gather a whole bunch of material for something that like, well, I'm, if, if this happens, I'm going to need that. And not in a hoarding sense, but like I'm quite happy with my library. It grows each month, but I have stuff that I, I have, you know, hundreds of books I haven't even opened, but I will when I'm doing that kind of work. So it's just, it's there. Like, I mean, I know you had from your first forays into ancestral altar stuff, you got some of those uh, those surprising effects of of kind of like knowledge and perspective in your life. So I know that at some stage when you're kind of like back in that mood, you're like, I have that whole fucking course I can go through and then you'll do it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes. I learned quite a bit about the pre Greg family and the whole family tree and how it's been way more affected by the actions of empire than I ever realized. And it seems I had a classic archetypal big gay uncle who I will never meet because of the big machine and how it treats people who are different, which folds right into the overall themes of the day, it seems. Yeah, I actually think I mentioned you from memory. I think I mentioned you in the course for that reason, as mm. an example of the kind of weird stuff that happens when people, every other culture in the world will tell you to get right with your ancestors and, and, and a lot of the problems in your life are friction problems that come from that sort of dysfunction. They're either hungry or sick, and you have that responsibility to be of assistance to them. But also, who else in the cosmos is going to have your back than your own family by and large? And even if your family is trash for multiple generations, the fact that you're alive means that you have ancestors that go back to the first human. I can promise you, you could be from the, and I'm sorry if this is the case, obviously, you can be from the worst, most violent, terrible family as far back as you can see. Let me tell you, you can't see that far. And there are people way up that lineage who have your back. And it's just really interesting to to get back into it's the same with magical geography, to get back into to being on to realizing that your feet touch an earth that's alive is the same thing as realizing that you are the scion or fountainhead of a vast army of the dead who want you to succeed because they made you, right? Mm. <laughs> and even just the perspective shift is enough to materially improve your life. And then when you approach that with humility, it, it does even more. Yeah, yeah. It's a great way to look at things. And hey, I like to hear about me, so maybe Ancestors will be my <laughs> next one. <laughs> but right on, man. This has been a lot of fun. Let's do the promotion thing we do and say that you do have some upcoming events. I'll see you in Austin at the Portland one this summer for sure, but let the people know about the things that they should know about. <laughs> 
Yes, absolutely. So I have a three-day workshop in New York on, I think it's the 5th, 6th, and 7th of, or 6th, 7th, 8th of December, uh, September rather, The Metaphysics of Desire. That's with a good friend of mine, Langston Kahn, who's a Brooklyn-based shaman. And that's going to be unpacking desire and, and kind of how how we get that wrong from a cultural and almost economic perspective and exploring the difference between want and need and, and what happens to your life when you kind of have a more embodied and healthy approach to desire. And that's going to be lots of ritual and, and journeying and, and so on. And I'm super excited. He and I have been working on that since the beginning of the year. So that's like probably about half sold out because we mentioned it a couple of days ago. And that's obviously very limited. We're in a, this large and fancy private residence in Upper Manhattan. So it's going to be great. That one I'm looking forward to. As I mentioned in the plus show that I will, and the tickets aren't available yet, so I'll just have to just keep an eye on the, the website or the Facebook page for it. But I will be speaking with Diana Walsh Pasulka about UFOs. And I think the event's called Technology is Habitat. So it's about UFOs and, and technology and their influence in the media at the Guggenheim, again in New York. And that'll be in the evening of Tuesday, September 10th. The tickets will be available from the Guggenheim website, and that's why I have no control over when they're available. But those are my two events that aren't yet sold out that are coming out. And otherwise, of course, runesoup.com is where everything is. Mm. Wow. Making moves, doing things. (laughs) It's always fun to hear what you got going on, man. You're definitely leaning into life. And I appreciate you spending some of your birthday with us today and really just for being along on what has been a pretty long ride at this point. Again, when we did that first interview many moons ago, we both had jobs, and now you're cultivating a Tasmanian permaculture paradise and taking wizarding adventures around the globe, and I'm getting in my five hours of stone gaming today. (laughs) (laughs) I uh, think it's going well for us, so keep doing the great things you're doing, man. Take care. You too. Oh, oh, it's magic, you know. Guys, 10 shows, a bit of a milestone for one of our guests, leaving Nick Redfern in the dust, because you can't have two dates to the ball, but a big happy birthday to Mr. White. Obviously, you're hearing this after the fact, but who doesn't like some well wishes? And the topics of this show really felt like I was running on two different cycles of time, because on a short cycle, Yeah, we just had a couple of shows talking about transhumanism and gender, and we also had a few recent guests with negative outlooks on Gnosticism, so it was pretty timely as a counterpoint to some very recent episodes, but me and Gordon talked about doing this kind of show over a year ago. I specifically said to him that we should try to get into postmodernism next time, but I'm not sure if it's really the best use of our time, because we can talk about so many epic and interesting things, do we want to bore people with the deep nuances of various philosophies? But I did get a lot of negative feedback over guests' suggestion that there's a transhumanist agenda behind autism and transgenderism. This isn't the first time it's come up. And when I say a lot of negative feedback, you got to put it in context If most people will say nothing and just listen and then go about their day. But it's like the old thing with the TV networks. You got a million people watching a show, something controversial is said, and then you get 500 letters about it. Well, people don't tend to write letters about not being offended. So angry, smaller groups of people who get loud can keep a show from getting controversial at all even though 500 letters should be no big deal if you have a million people watching. I'm scaling up to use simple math for an example, but you understand what I mean. But that said, I gotta walk a narrow line of being almost exclusively about controversial material and also remain a place where people on the margins of society feel as if they're included and we're on the same team. There's really no guide for this. I'm just doing it as I do it. We are often going to look at every little microcosm and trend and say, well, is there an agenda here? And sometimes that spotlight is going to shine on something uncomfortable or on a category in which we personally belong. But I hope you can grant me a little grace and tune in again next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. 
And I engaged with way more of these angry comments than is typical for me. And I think that's because I had some mixed feelings. And some would say, well, why don't you get a transgender person on to defend themselves? And I thought, well, number one, this show's motto is not fair and balanced. It's are we being fucked when it comes to X, Y, or Z? So it's not exactly the right approach. And number two, I don't think that being transgendered necessarily makes you any better equipped at speaking about the possibility of a conspiracy behind it. Obviously, a transgender person can talk about what it's like to have those thoughts and feelings from a position of experience, but it doesn't mean you know why you are that way. None of us do. None of us know why we are the way we are. And examining the roadmap to that is interesting. Is it nature? Is it nurture? Is it a dark, archonic, Luciferian agenda? But I do thank Gordon for having this thorny conversation when he really didn't have to. As he said, he's not even really a postmodernist. It's not really his hill to die on. But we can still talk about its merits and those conspiratorial opinions about it because he knows those as well. Even way back when we talked about Charles Fort, Gordon made a comment about how Charles used to change the labels on peach cans and various canned goods. And that sort of category play is postmodernism. And I thought about it then, but then I just waited until all this time later to really get in and try to unpack a lot of that. And decolonizing is a great term change, too. It's absolutely hard to get outside of the Western mindset when it's all you know, but a lack of culture and identity because you've been trampled by the empire is no small thing. And imagine generations later throwing off that yoke as a people and trying to piece back what you want to believe and properly control alt deleting anything that was imprinted by the tyrants that took you over. Surprise, probably Christians, more or less. It's very hard. We're sort of like sponges sometimes in that regard. And I don't think it's easy to go back and detangle your old ways sometimes. Native Americans, black people in America, the India example that Gordon gave, I mean, Think about that stuff a little bit. So it is good to see people pushing back against a system that's defining them for them. I've wrestled with it. I knew it would be a problematic definition to say this is a conspiracy show. I knew it would be taken less seriously if I embraced the stoner element. But we can overcome those judgments for people who stick around to not judge the book by its cover. I don't even know if that analogy makes sense, but when it comes to how we should live, what's right and proper, to frame it as, so you're saying a bunch of rich white men around the year 300 got it exactly right and we should conform to their structure forever, is really great. And I hope people sit with that for a while. I like that taking back the label maker phrase also. As I said, people should define themselves. Yes, of course, some people take that too far. But find me a topic area where we won't find some examples of people going off the handle with something. And if we're all just lost souls swimming in the fish bowl, then arguing with each other over how we should live to the benefit of the real oppressors, that's not good. I also don't want to see the behaviorists and social engineers take advantage of a growing sentiment and steer it in a way that suits what they want to see, rather than people truly finding themselves. That's in the mix too. Clearly, that can be hijacked, and that's up to each person to guard against and to just go live their best life. Is your best life criticizing transgenders on the internet? I'm not sure that it is. If we're getting into it, I really don't like that idea of giving children chemicals to block or alter their puberty process. That feels like child abuse in my eyes. 
But that has more to do with big pharma and the toxic system fucking chemical cocktails that they come up with. Everything has side effects. And just waiting until someone is through that childhood process and becomes an adult might be best. We have rules for smoking cigarettes, getting tattoos, and drinking alcohol. Maybe that same rule should apply to altering your testosterone and estrogen levels artificially. But even with that said, as Gordon mentioned, this transgender op issue gets way more airtime on these sorts of shows than it probably should. The numbers who would be affected here are quite small compared to something like GMOs, 5G, or vaccines. Again, powerful people will tell you a false story about reality to keep themselves in power, and that applies to all three of those areas. And it's sort of a catch-22 to say, damn the elite, I want to overcome this oppressive structure they've built for me, this rat race to nowhere. But on the other hand, we have to preserve our traditions or we'll all descend into chaos. It's interesting to see some people compartmentalize certain aspects of Western life when it's been shoved down our throats as the only way to be. You want two wives and they want to share a husband for whatever reason? Nope, not allowed. You will go to jail. You want to drop out of college? Well, good luck being fucked. You think you're gay? Oh, well, that's impossible. We'll electroshock that right out of you. Don't worry. How do you decouple the empire from these traditional values? I'm not saying I have a solution. These are just things I'm thinking about. And I knew there was going to be some risk here, but I'm hoping that people who feel disenfranchised by a few episodes of THC are now franchised again. Some commenters even said, well, I guess if your show is a place that makes straight white men happy, you don't have to worry about the smaller demographics. And that is a true statement. I probably don't have to worry about it. But I still do sometimes anyway, because I love all the outsiders. And maybe there is more than one way to look at some of this stuff. People send me emails where they list examples of gay characters on TV and say, here's another example of them pushing the gay agenda. And I just think, well, hold on. Gay people have been around forever. So this isn't a new thing. And so we have two choices. We can leave them out of all media and it's just a straight white paradise. Or we can give marginalized people some characters that they can relate to. And when you do that, conservatives will say it's an injection and an operation. And I think sometimes it's not really that big of a deal. Do you know anyone who's suddenly become gay because they resonated with a certain television character? I think that's a little silly. But... Regardless where you lie, don't crucify me, please, for trying to find some middle ground here, all right? And now that we've talked that to death, I really hope you heard the full two-hour show because we completely changed course from the heavy, Gnostic, transhumanistic, postmodern conversation and went hard into the weaponized disclosure we're seeing now. And I think Gordon is very clear-headed when picking apart what we're seeing and... I really loved that part of the show, and things like recasting the role of real-life Tony Stark, the dreadnought model, the case that Tom DeLonge is a mind-control victim. And you know, I asked that question, well, now that UFOs are being disclosed, when will we get the flying saucers? And the more I think about it, there is no guarantee that we ever will. We never got a non-military application for the stealth bomber or really submarines outside of a few tourist trap places. So just because they might say these nuts and bolts electrogravitic crafts exist, they might keep them in the military-only market well beyond the point in which they disclose they exist. Just a thought. But we also talked about a deeper level of the panspermia perspective and it being a constant process rather than a singular event, as I think a lot of people tend to think of it. And we also talked about Gordon's magic classes a lot, which are also fascinating topics for discussion. 
So do the damn thing and sign up for THC Plus already, especially if you thought this was an important checking of some persistent narratives in conspiracy world right now. And if you have your mind made up and don't like having your view challenged, listen again more closely because nobody dismissed the idea of manipulation completely, just that Maybe there's a way to have a conversation that doesn't feel quite so discriminatory. But in THC news, it seems like the website is done and ready to be implemented. But upon further reflection, we're in the middle of a goddamn Mercury retrograde. A lunar eclipse is coming on the 15th. And I just wanted to see what Austin Kopic was saying about the next couple of weeks and his analysis for the 15th in general, which was going to be the suggested launch day, and he says, The moon spends Monday en route to a series of difficult late-night aspects. This is, needless to say, not an auspicious time to schedule important projects. <laughs> so I don't think there's any harm in waiting until the space weather smooths out and Mercury is back to normal, which conveniently happens in August. And August just happens to be the anniversary of the plus system as a whole, the anniversary of the price change. Anything we've really done has been in August. It seems to be the time that we do things around here. And so August 8th, specifically, when Austin said would really dial in the best window, is when we're going to launch the new THC and we'll all live happily ever after in perfect harmony now that Epstein's been formally charged with child trafficking, right? But hey, that's another topic for another day. I'm getting out of here. Your move, culture dividers, empire riders, and label maker masters. Your fucking move. Call what? It's your show now. So what's it gonna be? Because people will tune in to hear another new conspiracy. Almost too much oh we thought this was low it's bad getting worse so where'd all the good people go they're on the higher side chats because it's everybody's favorite show where'd all the good people go he got your mars gold and white and then there's crow They talk this and that on the higher side chat testing one two now what you gonna do bad news misuse got too much to lose give me some truth now whose side we on whatever you say turn on the boob tube i'm in the mood to obey so lead me astray by the way now where'd all the good people go they locked them up it seems for protesting monsanto Where'd all the good people go? They're on the THC, my favorite show. Sitting down, new episode to hear. Wanna light a bolt, but I fear the police. Can you hear me? Can't interrupt me from this friendly conversation. All week for THC With the car wood There's no hesitation Exposing the truth Getting to the elite Scams, schemes, conspiracies And treason It's an excellent show What I need to know Is where'd all the good people go been only getting hate and fear from all the other hoes Where'd all the good people go? Guess that makes THC my favorite show Where'd all the good they people go? They talk this go? and that on the higher side chat Testing one, two, now what you gonna do? Bad news, misuse, got, give me some truth You got too much to lose Whose side are we on today? Okay, whatever you say Wrong and resolute, but in the mood to obey Station to station Desensitizing the nation Going 